Good evening. I'm Professor Chris Timpson, Faculty Board Chair for Philosophy. On behalf of the Faculty of Philosophy, I'd like to welcome you all to this special occasion to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the White's Professorship of Moral Philosophy. Um, I'm delighted to say, however, that this is more today than just an, an, just an anniversary celebration of a 400-year-old chair. I'm honored, moreover, to announce that the White's Professorship has recently been endowed thanks to a £2.8 million um, pound donation from the Sakira Foundation. To acknowledge this generous gift, the chair will now be known as the Sakira and White's Professorship of Moral Philosophy. The White Chair of Moral Philosophy was Oxford's first professorial post in philosophy. It's wonderful that in this, its 400th year, the chair has become the Sakira and White's professorship. This gift builds on a long history of interaction and collaboration between Czech and Oxford-based philosophers, dating back to um, John Wycliffe and Jan Hus in the late 14th and early 15th centuries, and then jumping much more into modern times in the, for example, in the 1970s and 1980s, Oxford philosophers being the very first people to um, heed the call to come and join the underground philosophy seminars that were going on in Prague, um, joining in and supporting uh, the, the um, ongoing philo philosophical activity under that difficult circumstances, uh, at no little personal risk, it might be added. Um, so we're delighted that we can continue in this same grand tradition of important connections, valuable intellectual and personal connections between the Czech people um, and the Czech Republic and Oxford. Coming to the present day, the university is immensely grateful to the Sakira Foundation for its continued friendship. The foundation has previously supported developments across the collegiate university, including the construction of Sakira House, uh, which is a student center at Harris Manchester College the installation of a bench honoring Vaclav Havel in the university parks, and stipends for postgraduate students of philosophy and legal theory, including those concerned with human rights issues. The Sakira Foundation was established by the Czech businessman Udek Sakira to support human rights, moral universalism, liberal values, and civil society. I'm delighted that Udek and a delegation of colleagues and friends are able to join us here tonight. I know that many of you have come all the way from the Czech Republic, so thank you for being here. You're all very welcome, and we are so glad that you've been able to join us. Thank you again to the Foundation for its generosity. And I will now hand over to Professor Hills, who will be chairing the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you again to everyone for joining us. I'm Alison Hills. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oxford University, and I'm going to be chairing this event on the subject of population ethics, uh, titled, Is Procreation Morally Wrong? Is it Obligatory? Tonight's event is part of the University of Oxford's Humanities Cultural Programme. So joining to me tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Jack McMahon, who, as you've heard, is now the Sakira and White's Professor of Moral Philosophy and a fellow of Corpus Christi College. We also have Hilary Graves, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford and Director of the Global Priorities Institute. And also John Broom, Emeritus White's Professor of Moral Philosophy and Emeritus Fellow of Corpus Christi College. In a moment, I'm going to be asking Professor McMahon to introduce some of the problems and paradoxes in population ethics and to share with us some of his work in that area. I will then invite Hilary and John to comment and ask questions. And then I'm going to open it up to the audience to share comments and questions, uh, both the audience here in the room and our online audience, who can comment or add questions by posting them in the live chat in YouTube. So, without any more time, I'm going to hand over to Jeff and uh, we're pleased to hear what you've got to say. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Alison. I've been asked to provide a brief explanation of my 
current research. In the past, I have written extensively about the ethics of killing. Now, rather than writing about causing people to cease to exist, I'm writing mainly about something a bit more pleasant, which is causing people to exist, uh, which is the fundamental subject matter of the area of moral philosophy known as population ethics. The traditional view about having children is that there's no moral reason to have a child just because the child would have a life that's well worth living. But there's also no moral reason not to have a child, provided that its life would be worth living, as most people's lives seem to be. So procreation has traditionally been regarded as morally optional. That is, it's permissible to have a child if one wants to, but also permissible not to. In recent years, however, uh, many people have begun to question the permissibility of having children. This past spring, an op-ed column in the New York Times bore the anguished headline, How Can I Justify Bringing New Life into This Terrible World? Part of what the author of this piece thinks makes the world terrible is climate change. And his concern is that his child would be a victim of climate change. Many others argue that the moral reason not to have children is that these children would become causers of climate change. Now these are familiar concerns, but there are also deeper, more characteristically philosophical reasons for thinking that procreation might actually be wrong, at least in many instances. I, I should say that I'm rather uh, acutely conscious of Hillary's uh, condition here, but don't worry. Um, in the end, you're going to be vindicated. So, um, There's a proposition in population ethics uh, that's often referred to as the asymmetry, with a capital A. The asymmetry is the claim that while there is a strong moral reason not to cause a person to exist if that person's life would be miserable, that is, if the person's life would have more in it that's bad than good, there nevertheless is no moral reason to cause a person to exist just because the person's life would be worth living. That's the common sense claim that I began with. And it's generally assumed among writers in population ethics that the asymmetry articulates the common sense view about re, uh, reproduction or having children. There are, however, two ways in which the asymmetry threatens to imply that procreation is often wrong, or at least that there is a moral presumption against the permissibility of having children. The first of these derives from the natural explanation of why it is that uh, there's a moral reason not to uh, cause a miserable person to exist. And that is that a person whose life would not be worth living would be harmed by being caused to exist. It causes a person to suffer and thus causes harm to that person. But if causing a miserable person to exist is overall harmful to that person, then by parity of reasoning, causing a well-off person to exist should be overall beneficial to that person. Yet, according to the asymmetry, there's no moral reason to confer benefits on people in this way. So, in short, the harms a person would suffer count against causing that person to exist, but the benefits a person would enjoy do not count in favor of causing that person to exist. And from that, it seems to follow that for it to be justifiable to inflict harms on people by causing them to exist, the harms have to be outweighed by something other, and something of moral significance, other than the benefits that people may enjoy from being caused to exist. For example, the interests that other people may have in bringing people into existence. But given that the aggregate amount of suffering that a person experiences over the course of a normal human lifetime is substantial, it seems likely that the interests of others are seldom sufficient to justify the infliction of that much suffering on a single innocent person. Remember, the benefits aren't supposed to count here. 
So, if there's a reason not to cause suffering by causing a person to exist, but no reason to produce happiness by causing a person to exist, it seems that the reason not to cause a person to exist should prevail, making it wrong to have a child. The second closely related objection to procreation that may seem implicit in the asymmetry is that whenever people decide to have a child, there's always a small but by no means negligible risk that the child's life will be miserable. That is, it will not be worth living. This risk, then, is a reason not to have a child. But if there's no moral reason to have a child, because of the benefits in the life, that might override the reason deriving from the risk, then again, there seems to be a presumption against the permissibility of having children. Now, I think that these challenges to the permissibility of procreation can be met by invoking a distinction between two different ways in which benefits, or the good things in life, can have normative force. A benefit is reason-giving when there's a moral reason to confer it. But it can also have an offsetting effect when it compensates someone for a harm. When people are caused to exist with a life that's well worth living, the benefits in their lives compensate them for the harms they suffer. The benefits, in other words, offset the harms in the lives of these people. And that may make it permissible to cause the people to exist, even if there's no positive reason to do so. Similarly, the risk of having a miserable life to which a person who's caused to exist is subjected is normally compensated for by the greater probability that the person's life will be worth living. In other words, the risk of misery is offset by the prospect of happiness, even when the prospect of happiness itself provides no moral reason to cause the person to exist. So in this way, I think we can accept the asymmetry while denying that it implies a presumption against the permissibility of procreation. There is, however, a remaining objection that's narrower in scope, but also more difficult to rebut. According to common sense morality, while there is a reason to benefit existing people when one can do so at reasonable cost, there's also a constraint against harming people. The effect of the constraint is that if benefiting a person would also unavoidably involve harming that person, the benefit must substantially outweigh the harm for it to be permissible to cause both without the consent of the person who would experience them. Suppose, for example, that it would be prudentially rational for me to accept some harm for the sake of some slightly greater benefit. Most of us believe, nonetheless, that it would be wrong for you to inflict that harm on me as either a means or a side effect of enabling me to have the benefit unless you have my consent to harm me in that way. But if this is true of harms, and benef harms inflicted and benefits conferred on existing people, it seems that it ought to be true as well uh, of harms and benefits caused by causing people to exist. People who can't, of course, consent to be caused to exist. But that suggests that for it to be permissible to have a child, one must be confident that the good things in the child's life will very substantially outweigh the bad things in the life. It implies, in other words, that it's wrong, if other things are equal, to cause a person to exist whose life would be worth living, but below some threshold of goodness. I have to say, I find that rather difficult to believe, but I think uh, John Broom finds a version of that view uh, plausible. Okay, thus far I have canvassed various reasons why having a child might be wrong. There are other considerations that support the claim that the expectation that a person would have a life that's worth living itself provides a reason for causing that person to exist. In examining these considerations, we can again begin with what I called the asymmetry. 
you'll recall the first of the two claims that constitute the asymmetry is that there's a strong reason not to cause a person to exist if that person's life would be miserable. I believe that this is obviously true, and as I indicated, I think that the most uh, plausible explanation of why it's true is that there is a constraint against harming people and that to cause a miserable person to exist is to harm that person. But, as I noted, if causing a person to exist with a miserable life harms that person, then causing a person to exist with a happy life should benefit that person. And while most of us believe that the reason not to harm people is stronger than the reason to give people benefits of equal magnitude, we don't believe that there's no moral reason to benefit people when we can do so at little cost to ourselves. So we do think that there's some reason to benefit people. So there's a tension in the asymmetry. The first claim of the asymmetry is in tension with the second. That is, if there's a strong reason not to harm people by causing them to exist with miserable lives, there should be at least some reason to benefit people by causing them to exist with happy lives. Well, you might think that we can explain common sense moral beliefs about procreation by taking into account that whereas there's normally no personal cost involved in not causing a miserable person to exist, having a happy child normally does involve substantial personal sacrifice even if one is in no way averse to having a child. And some people have made this argument. But I doubt that this can provide a full explanation. Although it's hard to imagine an example of this sort, it seems that we would be morally required to make very substantial sacrifices if that were necessary to avoid causing a miserable person to come into existence. Yet, most of us think that even a very slight disinclination to have a child is sufficient to justify not having one, even if that child's life could be expected to be very long and exceptionally happy. So I think that appeals to personal costs uh, are unable to resolve this tension that I think I've identified within the asymmetry, leaving the claim that there's no reason to have a happy child unsupported. Other grounds for believing that there are moral reasons to have children arise when we consider one of the central problems of population ethics known as the non-identity problem, uh, the significance of which was first recognized by the great Oxford moral philosopher Derek Parfit. I can illustrate uh, this problem, the non-identity problem, with the example of climate change. If we continue to follow current policies, people a century from now will experience suffering, injury, disease, and premature death as a result of climate change. But if we radically change global policies now, there will be far fewer of these terrible effects. But if we make large-scale changes in global policies, this will eventually affect the details of almost everybody's lives. In particular, people will increasingly conceive their children at different times, and different people will meet each other and have children together. After a hundred years, there may be few, if any, people who will exist who would have existed had we not changed policies. In other words, the shift in policies is going to affect who will exist 100 years from now. Now, this is of surprising significance, for it means that if we prevent, prevent the worst effects of climate change 100 years from now, the people who would have suffered those effects will never have existed. And this in turn means that if we do cause the worst effects of climate change, that will not be on balance bad or worse, for the people who will suffer those effects. For if we had not caused those effects, those people would never have existed. If their lives will be worth living, then our having caused climate change will, if anything, have been good for them. <laughs> 
But if our causing climate change won't be bad or worse for those who will suffer its worst effects, what's the objection to causing it? Well, what I think is that the non-identity problem compels us to accept that there's always a moral reason to cause a better off individual to exist rather than to cause a different, less well off individual to exist. And I think we're actually compelled to accept that the fundamental objection to causing climate change is just that it involves our causing less well off people to exist rather than different, better off people. I think that's what the non-identity problem forces us to have to concede or to accept. But if this is right, it raises many difficult questions. For example, how strong is this reason? Is the reason to cause a better off person to exist rather than a less well off person as strong as the reason not to cause an existing person to become equivalently less well off? Is the claim that we ought to cause better off people to exist objectionably eugenicist in character? Most importantly for our purposes, how can there be a strong moral reason to cause a well-off person to exist when the alternative is that a different, less well-off, but still well-off person will come into existence instead if there is no moral reason to cause a well-off person to exist, perhaps even the very same well-off person, when the alternative is that no new person will come into existence. It seems that if there's a strong reason to cause a well-off person to exist rather than a different, less well-off person, there must be some reason to cause a well-off person to exist rather than cause no person to exist at all. But if this is right, it seems that we can't explain why causing climate change is wrong without accepting that there are indeed moral reasons to cause people to exist just because their lives would be well worth living. And if there are moral reasons to cause well-off people to exist, this will have really profound implications for a range of moral issues, such as the risk of human extinction, genetic enhancement, embryo selection, abortion, and many other vitally important problems that we face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'd like to hand over to Hillary next for the next part. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. So I won't exactly be asking questions about what Jeff has said. What I want to do is rather offer a complementary angle um, on some of the issues that Jeff has addressed. And I want to think in particular about the implications of these um, reflections on population ethics for some of the largest challenges facing society today. In particular, about what to think about prospects of human extinction. So I'll organize my discussion around that theme, um, but the routes I'll explore will be applicable much more generally than that. Human extinction then. So of course, we all know that humanity is going to go extinct sometime. Most of us are resigned to that. The question is not whether, but rather when. If all went well, though, we could reasonably hope for a long and flourishing future for humanity. Estimates of just how long vary from a couple of hundred thousand years on the one hand to trillions of years at the other end, depending on one's degree of optimism about the capabilities of technology to sustain us through challenges that might wipe out a more technological, technologically primitive species. However, as is increasingly being recognized, there are very serious dangers that all might not go well. While technology could save us, it could also kill us. In particular, over the past generation or so, humanity has started to develop technologies that could fairly easily contain the seeds of our own premature destruction. A well-known early example of this, of course, arises from nuclear weapons. The 20th, 21st century versions include the possibility of truly catastrophic outcomes from runaway artificial intelligence or from engineered pandemics, um, far more serious and powerful than any that would naturally arise. 
Because of these threats, it's now becoming common to hear carefully considered estimates of the size of extinction risk this century on the order of, say, 10%. The former president of the Royal Society, Martin Rees, puts the number higher. He says 50%. And so experts are increasingly exhorting us as a society to take urgent action to address these threats. Key to this narrative, usually in the background, is the idea that it would indeed be catastrophically bad if humanity went prematurely extinct. And in the end, I think that is correct. If so, it's extremely important we recognize that it's correct. But to get to that conclusion, or to assess whether that conclusion's right or not, one needs to tangle with these questions of population ethics. And one common thought, somewhat related to the remarks Jeff made about the non-identity problem, one common thought pushing against the idea that extinction would be such a very bad thing is this thought that Premature extinction is, in some sense, in and of itself, a victimless crime. If, in fact, we do go prematurely extinct, then there are not, in fact, any of these further future people um, around to suffer any harms, to miss out on anything. And so you might think, then, there's nothing wrong with premature extinction. On the other hand, one can't shake the, uh, the thought pushing in the opposite direction, that even if we do, in fact, go um, prematurely extinct, there are, in some in relevant sense, countless possible people who would have existed and who, like most of us, would have considered themselves lucky to have been born if we hadn't gone prematurely extinct. So what should we make of these thoughts? To help get a handle on this, I want to back up a bit with apologies to the, to the moral philosophers in the room. Jeff's discussion of the conundrums of population ethics is framed directly in terms of moral reasons for or against particular actions that one might take. That's one framework for approaching the problems, but it's not the only possible one, um, and I think it's helpful to explore um, what some other approaches might look like. What I have in mind here is that it can also be helpful to ask ourselves directly not only what we have moral reasons to do, but also which outcomes of our possible ac actions would be better or worse than which other possible outcomes. So this distinction between reasons or oughts for actions on the one hand and betterness among outcomes on the other is central to moral philosophy. Why is it central? One, one might perhaps naively think that, come on, this is a distinction without a difference. Of course, isn't it obvious, almost by definition, what one ought to do in any given situation is just whatever would lead to the better outcome? Well, that's not a crazy view. Some moral philosophers think that. That view is called consequentialism among moral philosophers. But importantly, common sense morality, at least, rejects consequentialism. According to common sense morality, for example, Generally, you ought not to break a promise, even if you foresee that doing so would lead to a somewhat better outcome. Generally, you ought not to steal a bike, even if you'd be doing so in order to give the bike to, um, to, give the bike to somebody else who would gain significantly larger benefits from it. So in other words, according to common sense morality, ends don't always justify the means. Even according to this more commonsensical, non-consequentialist view, though, considerations of how good the various possible outcomes of your actions will be um, have to have at least some moral importance. So goodness or betterness of outcomes has to be some part of the discussion. It's just that non-consequentialists have the view that it's not the whole of the discussion. So I want to think about what happens when we bite off that chunk of population ethics that asks just which outcomes are better than which others when we're comparing states to affairs that differ over how many people get to exist. So this can potentially make the discussion more tractable because, as Jeff's discussion has illustrated, population ethics rapidly gets extremely complicated. If we think there's a sensible question of just which outcomes are better than which others that we can separate off, we can have that part of the discussion separately, and things might get a little bit easier to address, perhaps. Let's see. So first of all, before we get to population ethics, to see that betterness has to be part of the discussion in the context of moral philosophy in general, let's consider what happens when we vary the goodness stakes, perhaps in the bike stealing example. So it seems very plausible that you ought not to steal a bike from your neighbor in order to give it to a struggling student who needs a bike to get to her lectures, even if the neighbor could easily replace the bike, even if the student has no other workable transport option, etc. If, on the other hand, stealing a bike was the only way to get a policewoman to the scene of a crime in order to stop a child from being killed, so now we've upped the stakes. And if you knew this for sure, then very few of us would think that it was appropriate to give very much thought to this normal prohibition on stealing. So more generally, many philosophers think the appropriate morality for very high-stakes decisions when a lot of goodness and badness is at stake um, is 
much more consequentialist than the appropriate morality for lower stakes decisions. One application of this is that the morality applicable to public decision making, decision making by public agencies or governments or by society as a whole, tends to be significantly more consequentialist in character than the morality applicable to decision making for private individuals, considering relatively small decisions within their own lives. What about extinction? Well, the appropriate society-level response to extinction risks is, of course, a paradigm example of a high-stakes case. So if what I've just said is on the right track, this suggests that we might be well advised to consider questions about population ethics that are posed purely in terms of considering first which outcomes would be, would be better and by how much, in contrast to questions that ask directly for verdicts about what one ought to do in this or that decision situation without going via these considerations of betterness. Okay, well, there's an enormous number of theories one could sketch out and consider by way of answer to this general question of how do we compare states of affairs in terms of betterness when those states of affairs vary over how many people ever get brought into existence. It would be ridiculous of me in this forum to attempt anything like a survey of them, and I won't. And what I will do, though, is just sketch one very simple theory um, it is, in the end, the one that I and many other moral philosophers favor after reflection. This is an account we might call totalism. So it's very simple. Um, totalism says, in common with most other theories in this domain, first of all, that to every person's life, we can attach a number measuring how good that life is overall for the person who lives it. And then the, the point specific to totalism is the further claim that if you want to work out the goodness of a state of affairs, all you have to do is take the sum or the total of those goodness levels added up across all the people and all the other sentient creatures who ever get to exist in the state of affairs in question. This is, of course, just, cons um, just considering um, considerations of well-being, that the part of betterness that relates to well-being considerations. You might think there are others beside, but we're going to set those aside for simplicity here. So, for example, just to illustrate, suppose you you're comparing two states of affairs. Let's call them A and B. Suppose that in state of affairs A, 10 people exist with happy lives, Suppose that in state of affairs B, the same 10 people live with equally happy lives as in A, but in addition to that, another 10 people live and they also have happy lives. Then the totalist account of betterness would say that B is better than A because those 10 extra people who exist in B have happy lives, that is to say, their well-being is positive, and so they contribute positively to total well-being. Total well-being is higher in B than in A, so according to totalism, B is better than A. Okay, so there's one possible theory of betterness for population ethics. It won't be immediately appealing to everyone. Indeed, on closer inspection, it has some pretty counterintuitive features. Indeed, most people at first sight are horrified by this theory once they've thought fully through its implications. However, provably, every other po possible account of betterness for these variable population contexts also has some deeply counterintuitive features. We're in deep waters here. There are so-called impossibility theorems in population ethics. So after considering this, many of us come around to the view that totalism is, in the end, the most plausible account of betterness for variable populations. In particular, it turns out to be extremely hard even to sketch a minimally coherent theory of betterness, which gives expression to the intuitive idea that if you bring an additional happy person into existence and nobody else's well-being is affected, um, then you've done something that made the world neither better nor worse. That point has been convincingly made in work by John Broome. So some of the reasons why many of us end up sympathetic to totalism indeed mirror the considerations that Jeff was giving directly in terms of reasons for actions. Suppose we run with that theory then. If one does accept totalism, then what about extinction? Well, then one has a, a fairly clear explanation of how come it's so very important to prevent premature extinction because given the potential size of humanity's future and so the number of possible people who would lose their shot at life if we did go prematurely extinct, Premature extinction on this theory is not just a little bit worse than no premature extinction. It's enormously worse. The badness of extinction on this account aggregates across all those trillions or quadrillions or even more of possible people whose lives will be foregone if we went prematurely extinct. Okay, I mean, that's very far from being the only reason why one might consider it important to avoid premature extinction. One could reach somewhat similar conclusions by considering instead the meaningfulness of our own lives in terms of our connections to a potential long future, or by considering the intrinsic value, if there is any, in the long continuation of civilization, culture, human achievement, or many other things besides. So my conclusion definitely isn't that 
unless one agrees with this totalist approach that I've sketched, then one shouldn't favor the anti-extinction effort. It's rather that if, like me and many other moral philosophers, you do find yourself somewhat sympathetic to this totalist theory or something like it, um, then perhaps as far as uh, assessing the case for extinction goes, you at least need to look no further. Thank you very much, Hilary. Now I'll hand over to John for the final comments before opening it up to the audience. Good evening. Uh, I'm not going to talk directly about population ethics. Instead, I'm going to draw out of Jeff's talk and Hillary's talk some implications for how moral philosophy is developing or can develop um, that might have been rather surprising to Thomas White, uh, original benefactor. Uh, the title given to this event, um, the title of Jeff's talk, I think, is Is Procreation Morally Wrong? Is It Obligatory? And that suggests a concern with a question of private, personal morality. It's a question for people who are wondering whether it's okay for them to become parents or not. And of course, that is an important concern when we're thinking about the ethics of population. But we're, the ethics of population is also a concern for what might be called public morality, the morality of governments, of nations, uh, of states, um, big units rather than individuals. For instance, population ethics makes a very great difference to the response that our government should make towards uh, climate change. Population ethics is going to be relevant to any public policy that makes a difference to the way that the world's population develops in the future. And as Jeff pointed out, climate change policy will certainly make a difference to, what, to the people who will exist in the future. It will determine, it will affect which people exist, and it may well also affect how many people exist in the future. In fact, climate change raises an extreme possibility. Uh, one um, that Hillary mentioned, the possibility of human extinction. Uh, it might, I think, not tremendously probably, but it certainly possibly, it might lead to the extinction of the future human population altogether. And any policy that reduces climate change will reduce the probability that that uh, happens. According to Martin Weizmann, one of the leading economists of the environment, uh, sadly, who has died uh, recently, he thought that this possibility of human extinction was actually the most important consideration when it comes to making policy about climate change. He evidently thought that human extinction would be a very, very bad event, and he thought that the that the avoiding of human extinction was actually the most important aim in any policy that we make towards, uh, towards the climate. So Weizmann thought that population was the primary consideration in the policy, in climate policy. But there's also a great many other policies, public policies, that influence the world's future population. Some of them do so deliberately. Uh, China's one-child policy aimed at decreasing the number of Chinese people. Um, various European governments, on the other hand, adopt policies that are aimed at increasing the number of people in their, uh, their own nations. Um, and even policies that are not deliberately aimed at 
changing the population, very many of them will have the effect of altering the population. Any change in the tax regime, for instance, will alter the way that people live, it'll alter the way that people um, conduct their social lives, who meets whom, uh, what, date, what time they decide to have babies, even how many babies uh, that they, they have. So any, very many policies affect who uh, gets born in the future. Indeed, the questions of personal morality, the ones that um, are suggested by our title, is procreation morally wrong, is it obligatory? The answers to those questions are, in fact, going to be dependent on public policy. It's more likely to be morally permissible to bear a child in a country where public policy favors large families than in a country where it doesn't favor large families. So population ethics is crucially relevant to a great deal of public uh, policy. But on the other hand, in practice, public policy makers never take account of the effects of their actions on the future population. To take an example, NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, when it was evaluating fertility treatment as a treatment to be offered by the NHS to people, deliberately and explicitly ignored the well-being of the people who would be created as a result of the treatment. It was not, that well-being was not counted in its valuation at all. It seems extraordinary to me for a treatment that is explicitly intended to add to the population to be evaluated in a way that ignores the effect that it has on the population. I think the explanation of that is something that I call the intuition uh, of neutrality, which is a part of the uh, asymmetry intuition that uh, Jeff uh, described to us. Many of us naturally, and I think this includes nice, I suppose, are inclined to think that adding people to the population is ethically neutral. There's a famous remark by the philosopher Jan Narvison that expresses that idea. He said, we're in favor of making people happy, but neutral about making happy people. That's the intuition that Jeff talked uh, a lot about. I think we have to give it up. I think it's the that both Jeff and Hillary have given us reasons for giving it up, and there are further reasons beyond those too. Policymakers really should overcome it and begin to take notice of population ethics. One further implication for moral philosophy follows once we recognize that it is applicable to public morality. Public morality is concerned with very large numbers of people and often it's concerned with vast swathes of time. Climate change, policy on climate change is a clear example of that. So to make this policy, benefits and harms to very large numbers of people have to be taken into account. Public morality is therefore naturally a very quantitative uh, matter. And this means there is a role within moral philosophy for quantitative methods. Mathematics, even, can play an important part in moral philosophy, and this is one of the implications for the development of moral philosophy I was talking about. This is particularly true in virtue of something that uh, uh, Hillary said. Um, the policy, public morality, is most naturally uh, concerned with goodness, with making the world a better place and preventing it from becoming a worse place. It's value that it's largely aimed at rather than non-consequentialist considerations. And formal methods are very well suited to value theory, to developing the theory of value within moral philosophy. So... There is a room for more formal mathematical thinking in moral philosophy, and it's gaining a greater role within it, and I'd be very surprised if Thomas White foresaw that development. <laughs>
So thank you very much, John. Um, I'd now like to open it out to questions for any of the panelists, both from the audience here and our audience online. Yes, thank you. audience and then I'll hand over to Jeff and then to the others for, for their answers. So thank you very much for the question. So for the benefit of the online audience, the question was from the perspective of someone who's been uh, thinking and working about population decreases um, and asking why the panel focused so much on um, the value of human life and didn't take into account the further effects of having more humans on the planet and the environment and other creatures and took the view that when that was taken into account, there was a very good case for population reduction rather than a population increase, which is what generally people had argued for here. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to uh, yeah, invite the panel to, to respond to that. And um, first, Jeff. Right, thanks. Um, so I was a lot of to refer to individuals because I include non-human animals in all that I'm thinking here. So uh, nothing exclusive to human beings in the remarks that I made. Uh, insofar as it, uh, it, it's good to have uh, more human beings with lives that are well worth living, similarly it's good to have more non-human animals with lives that are worth living. Um, here's the problem, uh, s we, c we can imagine now a counterfactual world in which um, 
your and Pugwash's and Paul Ehrlich's uh, recommendations had been followed. And we have a much smaller population now with perhaps a higher average quality of life across many parts of the world. Um, there are an awful lot of people who are alive now and enjoying their, their lives and are very glad that they exist who wouldn't be here at all. Um, it, you know, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't want to be uh, a glib here, but um, you know, uh, 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 who would one suggest be the ones who ought not to be here, of the ones who are actually here? So one of the central questions in population ethics is precisely how we weigh considerations of quality of life and n number of lives, how much each individual uh, enjoys life, how many of us there should be enjoying the good things in life. Um, central question of population ethics, I haven't got a clue what the answer is. Hilary, would you like to say something? Yeah, so Jeff says some of the things that I would have said in particular about anti-speciesism. I think all moral philosophers would, would agree with that. And when we say people rather than sentient creatures, it's just that we're lazy and that word's shorter. Um, anyway, so following up from Jeff's remarks, um, suppose even that we accept what I was calling a totalist view. So suppose that is that we, we did accept, or we do accept that if other things were equal, then having more people around with happy lives would be a, a good-making a good feature of the world. You might nonetheless have the following sort of worry, and I take it this is one of the most central thoughts that, that I find most gripping about the environmentalist movement. Um, even if, what, if you, what you want to do is maximize something like number of people who get to enjoy the bounties of life in the long run, you might think it's short-sighted to try and cram too many people into the world now because of considerations related to something like the notion of carrying capacity. You might think, well, if we have too many people on the planet now, then we're going to end up with fewer people getting to exist on the planet in the long run because you'll have permanently reduced the number of people the Earth can indefinitely sustain. So if I believed that, if I confidently believed that, then I would, at the same time as having this abstract ethical view that in the end what we want is more people, then I would agree with, with you and your colleagues and co-authors that it would be clear we should want to have fewer people now. In fact, I, think I, I, ha I myself have what I think is a somewhat unorthodox view on that question of whether it would be short-sighted to have more people on the planet now, because it seems to me that the public discussion of that is somewhat one-sided. It's far from clear to me that having more people around now would reduce future carrying capacity. And the thought is something like this, um, that the central observation with the carrying capacity argument is that Things are environmentally stretched at the moment. There are water shortages, there's climate change, and so forth. Should we infer from that that the population is above carrying capacity in a way that has the sort of implications um, that would lead us to favor lower population? But it seems to me this depends sensitively on what you think the dynamics of progress are. If you think that the way progress happens is, first we make the kinds of progress that make the planet able to sustain larger populations, then and only then it's sensible to increase the population, then absolutely we should look at the way the world is today and the environmental problems and conclude that a lower population would be better. Um, it seems to me that that's not the most plausible account of the dynamics of progress. The more, more plausible account to my mind is one that follows the slogan, necessity is the mother of invention. It's because you have, too many pe because you have enough people to generate environmental problems in the in the short term, that then you see there are problems you have to face up to. Those sorts of things drive progress because you realize you have to come up with solutions to the problems. Those are the things that facilitate having longer populations in the long run. So I'm sure that you absolutely hate everything that I just said, and I admitted it was an unorthodox view. Um, but since you asked for perspectives from moral philosophers, there's one. And, and John. Thank you very much, Hilary and Jeff. Uh, John, would you like to comment? Yes, I, I think there may be, have been uh, a failing of presentation, actually. So, for example, Jeff was asking the question, is the fact that a baby, if we were to have a baby, would have a good life, does that constitute a reason for having the baby? And we concentrated on that question. But of course, simultaneously with that, it might be that there are very good reasons for not having a baby, which are 
what may be called the external effects of having the baby. If you have more people, uh, add an extra person to the planet, that's adding to the demands on the Earth's resources, and that has bad effects on all the other people, or may have bad effects on all the other, and it may have bad effects on the animals and the rest of nature too. But those external, external effects, I think we all recognize, we all recognize the possibility of them, the actuality of them, but when doing the philosophy, we tend to set them aside because we focus on the pure, the pure, simple question, if this were the only consideration, the well-being of the baby who appears, would that give us, uh, sorry, no, I think I said that wrong. Does the well-being of the baby give us a reason for creating the baby? And we set aside the question of all the other uh, reasons there are against it. So, for example, Hillary recommended totalism. But it's not obvious that totalism is implying that we should have a bigger population on the planet. That's a matter of the empirical relation between the number of people on the planet and how well off those people are. And if it turns out that increasing the number of people on the planet actually damages the well-being of the people that there already are, it may well be better for the total of well-being to have fewer people on the planet. I'm sorry, yes, I am. I, 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 we, we, I should have said individuals, but as the other two said, I think we, in moral philosophy we always take it for granted that non-human animals at, at least should be, should be included. Forgive me for that. Um, it, it may well be um, that totalism, it's an empirical question, what does totalism imply for the ideal population of the world? And it may be less than we have. We shouldn't take it for granted that it's more, but that's an empirical matter about the, the way that um, uh, population affects um, the well-being of the creatures on the earth. Thank you. Yeah, question over here. Uh, on the first uh, global summer, 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So again, if I could repeat that for the online audience, I think you're saying that if, um, would it really um, improve things if we reduce the population of this country? And wouldn't it be more important in terms of overall welfare to look at other policies such as equality amongst the people who are already existing? And that's where our focus should be instead of population ethics. Would anybody like to comment on that? I mean, an initial observation is that this doesn't seem like it has to be a competition. One, it's not that we can either do um, initiatives that will improve things, holding fixed what the population is, or do things that intervene on population size. We could, have, of course, do both of those things. So I think there's still, even if you think most of the action is in the former, there's still a place for a discussion of, okay, about the population, but what should we do about that? I'm wondering about the, I mean, the idea that with fewer people, uh, people would become less well off. Well, certainly that would be true if the reason the population were reduced was that lots of people died off and weren't replaced. Um, in general, the kind of uh, policies that are aimed at uh, reducing population levels of the sort that Mr. Johnson was uh, discussing, the idea is to, to reduce the population very slowly and gradually by um, decreasing the birth rate relative to the death rate or something like that so that there wouldn't be you know, some sudden loss of, uh, of people that one cares about or whatever. And I do wonder, for example, um, if, if, if uh, Victorian Britons were uh, much less happy than, than uh, British people are now on average. I, I, I don't know, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I agree with you that, it, it, in a way, what, what really is important is uh, uh, re reducing inequality among the people now. If we're concerned with uh, overall well-being, um, I, I think you're right about that, that uh, reducing inequality would have a, have a, a very powerful effect overall. Thank you. John. Yes, I think I want to agree with that. Perhaps um, that's to say agree with, with you um, uh, that there are certainly very other, other very important considerations apart from changing population. Um, perhaps I can just add this. Uh, I wonder whether your question about what would happen if population was halved was motivated by the observation of what's going on in quite a number of European countries at the moment, now that their population has stopped reproducing itself, that is, in those countries, going to lead to pretty serious problems. They're going to, especially as some of them are very resistant to immigration. So there are countries where not many babies are being born, immigrants are not allowed to come in, and they've got a real problem of how their, their older people are going to be sustained it, uh, once they've retired. So you're right, that could lead to, if the population declines that way, it can lead to serious problems. But um, uh, most of the people who are in favor of reducing the population of the world are aware of this and will try to make sure that it happens in a way that doesn't lead to that, those sort of conclusions, um, results. Uh, China didn't do very well in that respect. China built up a lot of serious problems for it by, by choosing the wrong way to decrease population. So what I'm saying is I, I see the motivation, but I'm not sure that it has a, a general implication for what we should think about increasing or decreasing population. Thank you. Uh, I think this will be our final question. Yes. Thanks. My name is Warwick. I think the relevance of population 
number of fairly obvious limited cases to require a degree of foresight about the future lives of your children that is simply not available. And therefore, I just wonder if the, the somewhat ideal scenario, scenario you posited of, of having information about the quality of life of your offspring is ever available. Thank you. Just again for the online audience, the question was, um, whilst it's very clear from what everyone has been saying that um, questions of population ethics are very relevant to public policy, can they really be quite relevant to um, individuals making decisions about whether they have to, to have children? Because wouldn't, for what Jeff and the others have said, that you would have to know so much about the, um, the life of your future child to know whether it was going to go well or not in order to make these decisions, and that information is just not available to individuals. So uh, isn't this just actually irrelevant to individual morality and decision-making? Jeff. Well, I, I concede that one can't have uh, precise information in individual cases, so one has to be guided in all cases by... Uh, probabilities and statistical information and I think if, if my view is that if we look around what we find is that um, most people have lives that are well worth living they are glad that they exist they have no desire to, to die and, and on the contrary most people are striving very hard to continue to live as long as they can um, it, there have been philosophers like Schopenhauer who challenge, and, and con, in the contemporary world, David Benatar and other people who go under the label anti-natalist, um, who think this is all an illusion and that we, we don't really uh, un understand that our lives really aren't worth living. Uh, and we need these philosophers to, to set us straight about this. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell, statistically, the probability that uh, anyone in this room having a child would lead to the existence of a person with a life that's well worth living, it, the probability is pretty high. Thanks. Uh, Hilary. Sure. I agree with all of that. Um, a different complementary answer would go back to the point that, that John made, that um, in real cases, of course, we, we can't pretend that our own child is the only one affected by bringing our child into existence. There are these externalities. There will be some systematic effects on the well-being of the people who would get to exist either way. And so you might think it's extremely relevant. Many people, particularly in the environmentalist movement, think it's extremely relevant to private morality, um, whether bringing an additional person into existence at the margin makes things better or worse for society overall. So you know, if I was to continue the discussion with our first questioner about um, about that issue, that discussion would involve lots of tangling with population ethics. And um, it would only be if we came out of that discussion thinking that it's at least not so bad to bring extra children into existence for the rest of society, that it's reasonable um, to, to continue to have additional children, you know, maybe above two or so. Like, for example, if I admitted to, to this question that this one here is my sixth child, I'm sure he'd think I'm just morally absolutely horrific. <laughs> <laughs> and jo John, would you like to comment? The only thing I want to say is that I'm very pleased you recognise the importance to public policy. What we need is to get the policymakers to recognise its importance to public policy, and at the moment, none of them do. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. I'd like to thank all the questions for, for the very interesting topics they, they raised. Um, I'd like to thank our panel, Professor Jeff McMahon, Professor Hilary Graves, and Professor John Brew. Thank you all. And finally, I'd like to thank again the Sakira Foundation. Thank you so much for your generous gift to endow the Sakira and White's Professorship of Moral Philosophy. And thank you to everyone here for joining us to celebrate that and to make this such a special occasion. So thank you all and good night.